Welcome to the Moms I Know with Sheila Walsh Denton and Maria Anderson Farner. Two moms on a mission to reclaim childhood and take you from surviving to thriving on your parenting journey. The Moms I Know is your go to source for motivation, inspiration, and resources, and real conversation about motherhood and parenting with intention. Thank you for being a part of our community. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If mothers could learn to do for themselves what they do for their children when these are overdone, we should have happier households. Let the mother go out to play. Welcome to the Moms I Know. Amber, thank you so much for that beautiful quote from Charlotte Mason. Um, So today we welcome Amber O'Neill Johnston, who fell in love with the principles of Charlotte Mason when her oldest was a preschooler. After wholeheartedly committing to following Mason's philosophy, she became disheartened when months went by with little mention, if any, of the stories and accomplishments of black people in her schoolroom. The literary quality of the books was better, but she found that the cultural emptiness she experienced as a schoolgirl was being perpetuated within the walls of her own home. Committed to bridging the gap for her four children, Amber has embarked on a journey of uniquely merging living books with life-giving books to ensure that their education is not a legalistic venture in Charlotte Mason, but an honest experience that honors the truth while helping her children to see the imago de in themselves and others. Amber speaks, writes, and shares her observations on home education, culture, books, global travel, and more. And when asked about her past, she likes to smile and say, in my house, Charlotte Mason has an Afro. So (laughs) Amber, welcome to our podcast today. We're so happy to have you here. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here with you. So we have been following you um, and just loving what you have been writing about and what you've been speaking about in terms of bringing this conversation to making it resonant for your children, but also for all children. And I think that this is a message that certainly, um, you know, here in 2020, I would have hoped that we would be far past this discussion. And yet here we are really with the events of the uh, the summer, really looking at helping to raise consciousness for all people. And I think that both Sheila and I have talked so often about classic literature and classic pastimes, and we've seen that lack of diversity in the classic literature, and we've been seeking it. And you have really done such a beautiful job of bringing this in for your for your own children and now speaking and sharing on a, on a broader stage for others. So we really appreciate the work that you've been doing. Thank you. I'm so happy to be able to share. It's become a passion of mine that I didn't even know was there. So. Well, I think that we all find our, our life's work comes from our own journey. And we've certainly experienced that as mothers ourselves. I I never intended to be a homeschooling consultant and an educational consultant. I thought I'd just be in the classroom and my kids would go to school. And yet our own children's paths are sometimes different and they bring us to a different place. And I, I really see that with your story. So I'm wondering if you could start for our listeners telling us a little bit about your story, how you um, are where you are right now, how you got there. Okay, so we decided to homeschool our children, and from the very beginning, I started studying and learning all these different homeschool philosophies and what type of materials and resources were available, and I found, you know, Charlotte Mason as a philosophy that just spoke to my heart, and I moved moved forward full force, and everything really was lovely from my perspective. I thought we were doing great. Um, but my daughter, my oldest child, she started um, showing some really concerning signs of what I can best categorize as self-hatred. So she would complain about her skin being ugly, and she has beautiful curly hair, the kind of hair people just die for. And she, I remember her telling me that her hair was disgusting And um, she was very young to be saying these things, but she had been home. Like, I was a stay-at-home mom before that, so I had no one to blame. I couldn't say, well, I sent her here, and they did this thing to her. I, to this day, don't know what happened, but she has always been hyper-aware of being different. 
And perhaps it was just because she was always the brown child in her environment. And maybe had she been in a different environment, she would have picked up on being different in some other way. But this is how it went. And it was heartbreaking for me because I had planned to raise our children to be colorblind. And I know the problems with that now, but that's a path of growth. That's not where I started. And I thought that if I taught her to love everyone and to see everyone the same and not to really talk about our differences, that she would grow to be a loving, kind-hearted person um, who could be different than maybe the way the world was at that time. So ultimately, I was raising her in the world I wished that we lived in instead of the world we actually are in. And she started acting out because of it. Um, And so she began to like lose her spunkiness and started asking me questions every time we left the house, where are we going, which is normal, and will I be the only brown person there? When we would get to a place, she would start counting people and count how many brown people were at the store or in a room with us. And again, she had no concept of race. So for her, brown people were anyone who wasn't white. And in fact, my Italian sister-in-law, she had even put in that category because she has such dark skin. Um, So she's literally just looking at the skin color. And um, yeah, so that's kind of what started me realizing that there was a huge problem. And um, I had to just take some time to be quiet. A lot of tears, a lot of prayers. And I feel like what God revealed to me was that I had not healed from my own childhood that looked very much the same way. And because of that, I just smiled all the time and I felt like I could raise her to smile and that everybody would be happy. And it wasn't working with her. She's much, she's much stronger than me. She wasn't willing to wear the mask. And so by dealing with her issues, I had to deal with mine first. I think that is such an important point that you make, that our children are stronger, I think, than than we were. I've certainly seen that with my own children and then now with my grandchildren. I mean, they're coming into the world right now with a purpose. And I think that, you know, I, I thought that we were really waking up in the 1970s and, you know, the 60s and the 70s. And what I realized is it's these layers and so now our children are coming to us and helping us to to forge these paths. And so, you know, I love seeing that your daughter brought you to this point. But you had found Charlotte Mason and were really hoping to use this classic literature, which also in listening to some of your talks, you grew up with. And it sounds yeah. like you loved. So. I did. I loved it. And but I didn't know there was anything else. So I loved I was an avid reader and I loved getting lost in the stories and they are really good stories. And I think that's part of sometimes what gets lost in these conversations. Um, And I understand it because we see that there's a problem and we want to fix the problem. So we think, well, if we get rid of all these books that lack diversity or cultural sensitivity and replace them with all of these new books, then we'll solve the problem. But I've argued that I don't think that that will solve the problem. Um, and that really the issue is not that we're focused on this or that, but truly can they live together? And so I think that my raising children who, who wouldn't hear the stories that I grew up on, that we can't laugh together about Anne and Diana, that we can't find ourselves lost in a garden and the door is hidden. I mean, these are amazing. Like, I just remember, you know, hiding in my house with these books. And I have kids I want to share that with. But um, at the same time, I recognize that in the beginning, when I was only sharing those books, I was making my daughter feel like she was invisible or like she didn't matter. She didn't exist or anyone like her exists in any of these books at all. And in the rare case that there was a mention, it was always negative. And so I was just kind of killing her spirit. And so I think that where I came, where it came down to it, I I started thinking maybe Charlotte Mason isn't for me. Maybe I'm not white and my kids are not white and it's really lovely for white people, but not for us. And so I backed up and I kind of sat with that for a minute. And then I went back and I thought about, like what my old pastor used to say about reading people's interpretations of the Bible 
And when something doesn't sit with you, you should go back to the source and take out the middleman. And I thought, let me read these volumes again. I had been reading a lot of blogs, a lot of websites, listening to a lot of speakers. Those were all wonderful. But I'm thinking, if I'm going to follow someone's philosophy, let me hear what she said. And when I went back and read what she said, I was like, this is so for me. This is for my family. Charlotte Mason is for my girl. And I thought, okay, now I understand what's happened. We have all, we all have our interpretations of things and they're not bad. Like the people who have taken her philosophy and turned it into a curriculum for people to purchase or use, they've done a great job because they created what worked for their families and they've blessed a lot of people. But I said, I have to do the same thing. I may not have a business where I'm selling it, but I have to take the philosophy and make it work for my family. And when I came to that revelation, then everything changed. And we just, freedom just came, and we began integrating all kinds of things into our studies. And we didn't let go of our classics either. We had to, we had to reduce them in order to make room, but we never let go of them. We still read them today. And I think we ended up in a beautiful place. And thankfully, I received that grace as a mother that my daughter is totally fine now. In fact, I ask her, you know, can I share your story? Because it is so personal. And she's like, yes, mama. She's like, tell everyone about what happened because I'm so happy now. That's so beautiful. And Really, I think that your whole philosophy of, I'd love for you to talk about the mirrors and the windows, because I think that you have taken that where, you know, it's so important for our children to see themselves in the literature, but also the literature as a doorway or a window into the world. And, and Sheila and I have also talked about the classic literature. These are, they're classic for a reason. They've withstood the test of time. They're themes that people have resonated with. They're incredible stories. And also the vocabulary is so much more rich with um, just, you know, we, we talk about well, what is a classic book. And it seems as if it's, you know, 50 or 60 years old or older, the language is just so much more rich. And yet there's also beautiful literature out there today. And it's coming from a much more diverse author pool as well. And so can you speak a little bit to the mirrors and the windows philosophy that you have created? Yeah, sure. So I, I didn't create it, but I'm bringing it to light in the homeschool market. So it was created by a professor at Ohio State named Rudine Sims, and she's amazing. I don't, I've never met her, but I've just read so much about her. And um, it resonated with me incredibly. So the mirrors, uh, the concept behind that is that children need to see themselves in books. Early on, when I was starting to talk a little bit, a chat a little bit about these ideas that were forming in my head online, and I was mentioning, you know, my daughter is struggling with some of these books, and I wonder, you know, do, does anyone else feel like they're lacking diversity? A lot of what I got back was that children need to use their imaginations, and that we shouldn't put it in the child's head. They can imagine themselves in any book. And I was like, yeah, that's true. But then when I would go to bed at night, and I would think about it, I'm like, no. Nope that's hogwash. And that, you know, we don't tell them to imagine every other thing. They're young and she doesn't imagine her bedroom being purple. It gets to be purple. You know, she doesn't imagine that she's playing outside with her daddy when he comes home from work. She actually is doing that. And I don't think it's fair to ask one group of children to always use their imagination on something. And so the idea behind the mirrors is that children will be able to see themselves in some of the books that they read and a lot of the books that they read. And for me, that meant my children seeing black people, black families operating and living and loving and struggling and thriving all throughout different parts of history. Um, But for some families, the mirror will be different. And that's what I love about it. It's not a set. It's not something that's set. It's not a book list. I can never tell another family exactly what their mirrors will be. They could be skin color related. They could be. I even remember a mom asking me because her daughter developed very early. And that was so hard for her. And did I know any stories with characters of young girls who were just very developed? And I'm like, wow, what about children who have special needs or children with autism or girls or boys who are deaf? I see them. Or if you have a single parent household in the middle of all of these intact homeschool families, so many things that you could read about where you could see that you're not alone 
and that it's going to be okay and that we see you. Society sees you. Your mama sees you. If you don't have a mama, other people in the community see you. So that's where the idea of the mirrors came in. And for some people, that's easier. I know that's easier for me because when I read things about black people, they just naturally resonate with me as truth or I can see the lack of authenticity or the stereotypes, which some are sometimes true, but I can see the stereotypes that aren't true. I hear immediately my ears start ringing when something's hurtful or if something's life-giving. So the windows are a little bit different and they're more difficult for a lot of us. The windows, the idea there that children will use books and they'll be able to see other people through those books, the way they live and the way their families operate. And when they're looking through the windows at those, those other families in these books, they're going to see all of the differences, lots of differences, and learn to respect and love and expect and understand differences, but they're also going to see tons of similarities. Oh, all children play and smile and love to be with their grandmothers in every society across the world, throughout all of time. And so that was kind of the idea behind the windows. And that's a, a bigger struggle for us because I can't, when I'm looking for stories of our indigenous people or um, Asian Pacific stories or stories from little boys in Mexico, I, I can't hear the bad stuff as much, the stereotypes or what might not be quite right. And so I have to rely on other mothers and reviews and other things as I learn from my friends and other people online so that I can provide really great windows as well. So that's kind of the idea behind it. I love that, the mirrors and the windows. And I feel as if, you know, when, when my children were young, I have a, a son and a daughter and then an older stepson. And finding literature that resonated for my daughter when so much of it was these, you know, white boys as the heroes of the stories. And so trying to find that gender equity as well and finding these stories with strong female lead characters. And, and you know, I think we have many of those in classic literature, but there's still the stereotypes. And so whether it's gender equity, whether it's racial equity, whether it's, you know, you've talked about so many different types of people and we're all going to be, I think as human nature, we look for the differences, but we also do look for the similarities. And so I think that when we are talking about literature, it's important to heighten our awareness about all of this. I know for me, I've always liked to pre-read for my, you know, before I would recommend a book or give a book to my children. My children were both also late readers. And so we did a lot of family reading. And so we could choose the literature, which I really appreciated. As your children are getting older and they're self-selecting, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about, you know, do you do a lot of pre-reading? And then also when there's literature that has things that you might find offensive, how do you address those things as they come up? Okay, so in the beginning, I pre-read every single thing. I wouldn't put a thing in front of them without reading it first. And it was, yeah, I wanted to protect them because I wasn't ready for them to ever hear any instances of some of that. They were really young. As they got older and became independent readers, I still intended to pre-read everything, but they outpaced me. I was holding them back. No, you can't go on to the next chapter because I haven't read this yet. And then I'm telling my husband, no, I can't watch a movie with you tonight because I have to read this book so that she can read the chapter tomorrow. And he's looking at me like, okay, well, we're going to have to switch that up somehow. Um, and so I realized that it's ridiculous that I would be holding my children back from reading a great book because I can't keep up. And I began to loosen the reins there. And now um, the way that I've handled that is they are free to read anything on our shelves, generally, the older children, not so much the younger ones that they can't read anyway. So um, I curate at the door. And once it's in our homes, on our shelves, it's available to you. So that means that I'm very careful about what I buy or what I allow it into the house. But once it's here, it's open to you. Um, and that's how I've been handling it. So they have freedom, absolute total freedom within whatever they can find on our bookshelves. And this is going to sh shake a lot of people in their boots, but we don't go to the library a lot because of that. Um, so some of the books my children were picking up off the library shelves 
and they were getting excited about and wanting to bring home. And I know some people feel like any book is a good book, but I wasn't finding that to be the case. And we were struggling. And so we go to the library for specific reasons at specific times for books that we're looking for and all of that to enjoy the library services and programs. But our library, our home library is our main source. Um, in terms of books that have difficult things, I have a really strong, strong separation or distinction between racist ideas that are presented in nonfiction books as fact, because we're maybe we're using old books, and that's what the author thought and presents it as that's true. And then versus a historical fiction book that is telling us more about the people of that time period and what they were thinking in the midst of a story. Um, and for some people, I know that they felt that that's like, what's the difference? Well, it's a huge difference. It's one thing for me to tell you a story about a racist person that's very realistic for that time period versus me to be teaching you about history or plants, which happened to me, um, reading a nature book about cotton plants and them talking about the Negroes in the field and how beautiful a sight it was. See, that's a real problem for me because that was a nonfiction book and it was being, that idea was being presented as something real. And um, so that's another way I don't accept it at all in nonfiction books, but I accept a lot of it in historical fiction and we talk through it. So this concept of talking through it, I remember when my children were very young and I would be reading something and I would come to a passage and I thought, okay, we're not ready to discuss this yet. And I would kind of skip over that. And then when we would revisit that book a year or two later and I felt that they were ready, I remember, you know, even just like Little House on the Prairie and the uh, attitude towards the Native Americans. And Pa sort of had one perspective and Ma had another. And when the children were old enough, we stopped and we discussed and I asked them questions. Do you see the difference here? There's slightly different um, views on all of this. And so, you know, you can take those moments as incredible teaching moments. I also know that there were times when people felt that we were censoring things, and I don't feel that it's censorship. I feel like it's looking at what's developmentally appropriate for children at different stages, what they're ready for. And, you know, each child is going to be different as well. And and yeah. then how much consciousness you know, we bring to that to that child, you know, when they're very young, we want them to just be living in a world of, of goodness and beauty. And obviously we can't shelter them from everything, but we want to be letting them have that gift of childhood. Sheila and I talk a lot about being the guardians of childhood and letting children have that. And yet we also then, as they get older, have to prepare them for all of these kinds of things that they're going to encounter. And so I think that you've spoken to that kind of that pre-reading and that choice and you know your your take on the libraries I, I'm laughing because I always had sort of that same feeling like when we would go to the library and they'd pick up these books that were just fluff I think is how one of my mentors referred to them that they just weren't of substance and it's it's like anything in the world you know we we want to provide really wholesome activities for our children and we don't want to deprive them of all of the things that are out there but it's you know it's like Candy, you know, we let them have it occasionally. It's not a steady diet because we know that's not going to be good for them. And so, you know, I looked at literature that same way. Well, I was just going to say that I've gotten that argument about the censorship so many times. And to that, I say, yes, I'm censoring for my children. <laughs> censorship in terms of our rights as Americans to hear things and to be able to speak, and that's for adults. And so I do not believe in censorship of any sort for adults. But for children, I mean, I censor their movies, I censor their music and their clothes and their food and their books. And I think that makes so much sense. So it confuses me a bit. And I often feel that there's a little bit of a hidden agenda behind people who keep insisting that we not censor books for children. Now, if we start doing that for ourselves, then we have a problem, sure. Um, I was going to say that. And then I was just going to mention that my favorite thing about the library is actually the librarian. Yeah. That's what I that's where I want my kids to go. I, we try to go at the slowest time because that's where I really want them to get out of the library is to spend time with the librarian. I totally agree with you. I, and I like to think of it instead of censor as curating. You know, like I really try to like you're curating the bookshelf and that's exactly what you're doing for the yeah. kids at you know, the ages. And I think that's the, the gift of homeschooling as well is that we're able to do that with our bookshelves and 
I think part of this discussion, we need to really be like, how can we bring more um, the literature to the classrooms in a way, you know, for, for, for more students, for more um, inclusivity in the classroom? Because my third, like Maria said, we've had experiences of all types of education. And my youngest, my 11-year-old was the first one. She went back into the classroom into a charter school at the early in third grade. And the books that she was bringing home was so different in the experience that my older children you know, um, had with me curating their bookshelf and it, and it gave me, it was really hard. It was really sad. And so, um, I think it is important as parents to bring in this good literature and to have it be a starting point. And I just really want to appreciate you, Amber, because I really like what you said and it's going to stick with me is the, the path of growth that you're on. And I think, you know, people might like, you can start right now. You know what I mean? It's like you're definitely not where you started. And I used to be, I'm kind of a part-time nutritionist, and that's where I say it's like you can, you can start today, you can start tomorrow, but we are all on a path of growth. And I really think that's really a um, it's a mindset thing that we, we can do this. And um, it's up to us, really. So I can see why we connect. I'm also a nutritionist. So ah. I think that's really, yeah, I think that's really cool. I'm always using food analogies. I have to, like, keep myself from doing it. But, um, yeah, I think that I like, for people to hear me say that because I know that a lot of people are like, wow, I wish I was like that. I wish I had a really diverse library or I wish I was doing these amazing history lessons with my kids. And so the thing is like, you can't compare where you are today to, or, or your Valley to my mountain. And also this is just one area. And what I found with my friendships that I can help my friends in this one area because it's a passion of mine and I've become really good at it. But there are other things. I mean, I'm sitting here, I have like my crocheting here and other things that my friends are helping me to become really good at because they're experts and they've been doing it their whole lives and they've had growth in those areas. So I try not to compare my valleys to their mountains and ask them not to do that as well, because the amazing thing is there's nothing that I've done with my kids that no one, no one else can do, and that I've made a ton of mistakes and fumbles. There have been books that I've read aloud to my kids that when I ha- speak with, with a friend from that culture, they're like, oh, that was not a winner, girl. Let me tell you what was wrong with that book. And once they tell me, I'm like, oh, I see it. I just didn't see it. And I'm so thankful for the people that can speak to me with grace and correct me without getting angry or calling me names or just feeling like I'm dumb or stupid because I, I'm still learning. And I think we all are. And from this is the andness of this is the andness of the classic books and books with, you know, diversity and everything. And so if we can really bring that into our homeschool, just, you know, the andness. Um, I have a question now kind of getting to the, like the practical, but where do you find these books that like, where can, what can we tell, where can we tell our listeners to look for these books with um, more diversity, with more, you know, um, really, you know, gender equity, racial equity, like all these things, where are you finding these books? And do you, I saw on your website, you do have a list that you're offering with curriculum. That, that looked awesome. But do you have any, like, where are you finding them? So I, um, Oh my goodness, from all over. So it's been difficult for me. So I can narrow it down to just a a few things. Um, I find them online from other parents, other moms who have read them already and are giving their thoughts to them. And I try to do the same. And so we scream from the mountaintop, this is so awesome. You have to get it today, not later, now. Or we're like, it's okay, but page 87, that's got to go. You're going to have to rip that one out, you know? And so I get a lot from just that grassroots type of a thing. Um, so there's like a Facebook group that's living books for all peoples, I believe it is. And so I, I get a lot from there, from searches. You don't even really have to say much on there. You can just do a lot of searching. And um, there's a website called the Parallel Nar- Narrative. Um, where someone I've become friends with and she has, she shares this passion with me and puts books over different time periods. Um, uh, Charlotte Mason City Living is another website where she has an ongoing multicultural history list. Um, again, none of these are famous people, right? They're all moms. I feel like we're all in our basements doing this, um, but we've connected. 
um, over the internet. So um, that's definitely one. And then an, a website called Reshelving Alexandria, which is this like amazing, just huge database of books and a lot of them and, and increasingly every day they're adding more and more diverse books and they give summaries and little information. So I just scour those and honestly, you know, websites. So Brown Sugar and Spice online bookstore is one of my favorites. It's um, brownssbooks.com and it's a small independently owned bookstore online and she specializes in stories about children of color and so I just pour myself some tea and get on there and flip through all the pages and I just buy stuff um, and so that's kind of it I don't have like a, a major rule one of the problems I run into is that a lot of the books we love in our home are out of print and oh if I had a printing press um, the things I would do with it because I don't know quite what happened, but it, apparently there was a time when a lot of these books um, featuring little black children were printed. They were made. They exist. I have copies of some of them. And yeah, so in the 70s, I yeah. bet. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> but I'm just like when Maria was saying in the early, you know, late 60s, the civil rights movement. I bet that's when it was, you know. That's probably, yeah. That's yeah. That, that must be it. I know there was a big, a lot of stuff I had that was, that people were creating during the Harlem Renaissance as well. Mm -hmm. And those books have gone out of print or some of them have been reprinted and the reprint is out of print. Um, and so if I can get my hand, sometimes I spend too much on books, but I try not to. If I can get my hands on that, on some of those books, then we use them. But the problem becomes I'm very aware now of trying to find newer books because people want to hear what I'm using. And I hate that, I, you know, when I'm sharing, these are the 10 books I'm reading right now to my kids and none of them are available to you. Sorry. You know, so I try to mix it up. Um, but we had a heyday. I'd like for it to come back. <laughs> I, I think it can. I think it will. You know, I'm, I follow like the Brown Bookshelf, um, on Instagram, the Conscious Kid, you know, so I'm trying to diversify my own IG feed as well and, and getting these ideas, but you just gave us so many resources. I can't wait to dive in. So thank you. You're welcome. And it is coming and, you know, it's, it's just so beautiful to see people opening up to this awareness of what we didn't know. And, you know, Amber, you spoke to that of just this, this, awareness and then talking with people and if we can have these open conversations about what is working what is not working and oh you know yeah I blew that and a friend you know I've got friends from a lot of different backgrounds and they're calling me out all the time it's like whoa whoa wait a minute you know do you, do you hear what you just said or that wasn't my experience let me tell you my experience and then I have my own experience and my children have their own experiences and so when we listen to each other when we share these um, these ideas and these the universal truths too. And so I feel as if there is so much hope. I mean, even we've talked about just, you know, COVID-19 being this time of opportunity where all of a sudden we're all pausing a little bit and, and looking at things differently and more deeply. And then of course with, you know, with the death of George Floyd, you know, the entire world is now looking at things through a, a, a magnifying glass. And so we're really, trying to make sure that every conversation that we have, every choice that we make, every activity that we do, that we're looking at the, the roots of this and what we're sharing with our children is so important. And they're watching every little thing that we are saying and doing. And so it's so important for us to raise our children with this awareness and this consciousness I wanted to ask you about one other thing before we go, and that is you talk about um, finding black homeschool groups. And both Sheila and I, you know, on our paths with homeschooling, there was there was not much diversity. There were not many Hispanic families that were coming to homeschooling. There were not many black families coming to homeschooling. You know, in, in our community in Santa Cruz, it was predominantly white. There were a couple of biracial families that we worked with. And so... I'm seeing and hearing more about black homeschoolers and, you know, we were always trying to find that diversity within our communities for our children. And so you have spoken a little bit about finding the black homeschool groups and, and the comfort there. And so that I wanted to talk a little bit about this balance of, you know, you also talked about, you know, raising your children with this colorblindness. And we now know, you know, we're, of course, we don't want to be colorblind, but we want to be color aware and, right. cele and celebrate Right. And so, um, and yet sometimes we also 
I mean, it's just like, you know, when we want to be with family and just be comfortable. So I'm wondering if you'd be willing to talk a little bit about that. So, yeah, I think that um, what, uh, what, is, what was happening was that it is really hard to be the only black person in an all-white environment. And it took a long time for me to be able to say that out loud. Um, but that's just the truth about it. And it really isn't sure. It is somewhat related to how they treat you. But in my case, I, we're members of a, of a homeschool group that's all white until very recently. I, I was like, listen, girl, I'll pay. I'll pay your membership fee if you join this group with me. But it's mostly, you know, until then, it was an all white group. And um, those moms are consistently kind to me and every member of my family from the day that I met them until today. It's why we're still in the group. I can't think of what I could ask them to do that could take away the feeling that I have sometimes when I'm with them. And so that's where the tension lies for me. I'm not an expert. I'm not a sociologist. I don't know. I'd love to unpack it with some people someday. But there is um, a feeling where I am conforming to their comfort zone. And it's also, it's not a totally uncomfortable place for me either. I was born and raised in that place, but I'm still different than when I'm with an all black group. And I don't say that to celebrate or say that that's great or that's the way it should be. I'm just saying that that's just the way it is. And so there was a feeling that like, I wanted to kind of like, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but you know, when you come home at the end of the day, and you take your bra off. You're like, I'm not leaving anymore. Like, I'm just here today. I wanted to be able to just take my bra off. And, you know, I have big hair. And some days it's like sticking out. And I wanted to be able to walk into a space where no one thought twice about it. And that I didn't have to be coiffed or I could say something or I could talk in black vernacular English and no one think anything of it because they are very aware that I can speak the perfect King's English at any moment. There's no judgment, but I can just be like, girl, no. Nah. You know, and everybody's fine with it. And so I realized that there shouldn't be shame in expressing that feeling because it's just a rare opportunity to be able to sit in that space and put your feet up on the coffee table. And for me, it's been very important that people understand that I didn't leave a space. I didn't leave a white space to go to a black space. I added a black space to the white, completely white world that my family lived in. And, you know, for that, I'm grateful for the opportunity, and it's made our lives much richer. Oh, I think we could all appreciate that so, so much. It's, it's just a human, a human feeling. So it's humanity. You. Yeah. You know, thank you. You've expressed that so honestly. So, Amber, for our listeners who are undoubtedly going to want to find out much more about you and be following you, can you tell us how we can find you on all of your platforms? Sure. I blog at heritagemom.com and you can find me on Instagram at heritagemomblog. And um, most, you know, I, I talk about Charlotte Mason, homeschooling, and also just things that appeal to all parents and who are wishing or hoping for that multicultural um, or diversity um, component in their homes. Um, and I also sell what you mentioned, Sheila mentioned briefly, heritage packs. And so I have six different ones that span all ages from first to sixth grade, different ones. And they're basically lesson guides, multicultural enrichment lesson guides that you can add on to whatever homeschool curriculum you love or whatever curriculum your child's doing in school that you want to add this when they're at home. And it's not a perfect solution. It'd be great if everything was integrated in. But you know what? It's the darn good one. And um, so that's just kind of what I've offered back to the community. I love it. Thank you. You're welcome. And before we sign off, Amber, is there anything else that you want to add that you feel we should have on our episode here? I would just say, like, my last words would be to not be afraid. I hear a lot of people are holding back from maybe making some of these changes in their homes or with their kids because they're afraid they'll say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing. And that fear is keeping them stuck. And I just want to say you will make mistakes. So maybe just get over that with yourself and have a cookie and some tea and then just say that even though I know I'm going to mess up, it's important enough for me that I'm going to do it anyway. Fabulous. 
Well, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us here today to heighten our awareness and to share with our listeners your views and your the work that you're doing. And we really appreciate it. you've given us such a wealth of information. So thank you so very much. Thank you're you. welcome. Thanks for having me. Uh, take care. Thanks for joining us today for the Moms I Know. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. To get the show notes and resources mentioned in today's episode, visit themomsiknow.com. For information on Maria's programs, visit thefutureoffamily.com. And for information on Sheila's programs, visit purplebeatfamily.com. Don't forget to subscribe and rate us on iTunes and follow us on Instagram at the Moms I Know Podcast. Until next time, have a joyful family journey.